Um, welcome to our white paper launch. This is perhaps the most exciting part of the uh, week-long conversation and collaboration because this is where we get to share with you the kinds of thoughts we have been having uh, going back and forth as well as really get your inputs um, in terms of the way in which we are thinking through some of the concepts. So this particular um, collaboration with Murdoch uh, wanted to work on one of the key theoretical tenets of the culture-centered approach, which is voice, and really work at the question of voice, uh, looking at it from the refugee context, and really bringing in uh, Murdoch's work within the context of voice, refugee voice, refugee advocacy, and seeing how that relates to some of the uh, key conceptual tenets of the CCA as they relate to voice. So the way in which we are going to do it is that I'm going to set up some uh, theoretical strands of the uh, literature on voice and how voice emerges in uh, the literature on the culture-centered approach. And then Murdoch is going to talk about uh, the question of refugee voice in New Zealand. And then we will sort of look at some future directions from this conversation and hopefully uh, engage uh, your thoughts and ideas in terms of how to uh, grapple with this uh, question. Cool. So, you know, in uh, the culture-centered approach, we sort of draw from subaltern studies theory that argues that uh, erasures uh, constitute uh, material disenfranchisement. So. Uh, a subaltern is someone who has uh, been disconnected from pathways of mobility, uh, movement. And in CCA, then we begin with that idea to argue that uh, the disconnection from pathways of mobility is intrinsically tied to the erasure from communicative spaces and infrastructures where the subaltern uh, might have a voice in decision making. So one of the key concepts in terms of thinking about structural transformation, and this um, connects with you know, some of the work of Nancy Frazier, uh, who talks about uh, the politics of recognition and representation, and particularly connecting a representation with uh, a politics of structural equality. So in a sense that uh, communicative equality, the equality of access to communicative and democratic spaces is intrinsic to achieving uh, economic um, equality. In that sense, then, in the CCA, we uh, grapple with the question, what does it mean for communities to own these communication infrastructures? And with respect to that, two questions usually come to mind. One is, how do we even conceptualize communication infrastructures, especially when it relates to uh, subaltern communities that have been systematically erased? Because the very idea of even what makes up communication and what makes up a uh, communication infrastructure is embedded within um, hegemonic formations. That's one part. The other part is, of course, in order uh, to have a voice that matters and uh, that um, actually uh, disrupts uh, dominant configurations, uh, it's important for those communicative infrastructures uh, to engage with dominant sites of meaning making and articulation. In other words, if you think about, for instance, within the refugee context, a specific refugee struggle, and uh, there might be refugee platforms that are internal to a specific refugee community, but to that extent that those platforms do not enter into the mainstream, the opportunities for policy transformation or transformation of structures become limited. So the idea of communicative infrastructures in this sense um, uh, struggles with this notion of being impure in a sense that something that is embedded in subaltern rationality and logic, but also that has to engage with dominant uh, hegemonic notions of what communication is. So this relates to also then the concept of uh, culture, structure, and agency in a sense that if voice is an um, expression of agency, the agentic and meaning-making capacities of communities uh, to make decisions, to make sense of situations, and to uh, 
participate in actions, uh, that agency uh, becomes also an embodied site for voice. In other words, it is through voice that agency is expressed, or we come to recognize voice as um, Axel Honneth would say, um, as a way for us to understand the agentic capacities of communities and people. And this is something that is universal. So in his work on disrespect, uh, Honneth argues that for every um, individual and in the communities in which they live, uh, the desire to be recognized uh, is intrinsic to a sense of dignity. And uh, to be uh, disrespected, therefore, is intertwined with how power plays out. And the work of criti the Critical Theory Project is one of uh, transforming, transforming these sites of disrespect. So agency, in this sense, becomes a way for uh, uh, resisting and transforming those spaces where disrespect perpetuates. And in that sense, uh, challenging those structures and thinking about uh, structures as not only material but discursive through communicative processes. So voice becomes a way for transforming, for instance, the stigmas, uh, the disenfranchisements that subaltern communities often experience. So say, for instance, if the uh, projection of a specific uh, refugee community uh, works in terms of uh, that particular community being uh, terror threats or bringing in terror into the nation. Uh, voice becomes a way in which uh, that indignity or that threat to dignity is uh, disrupted through messages and communicative articulations that emerge from uh, community sites and spaces. So in this sense, culture is really important because culture is the site where this contestation uh, take place. On one hand, culture perpetuates the dominant narratives that enable uh, the structural marginalization, but also culture becomes the site of storytelling and um, uh, introducing new kinds of stories and narratives through which dominant uh, structures can be changed. This goes back to then our first point about communicative infrastructures, because you can see how then ownership of communicative infrastructures and voice emerging from these infrastructures can become a way for transforming and challenging structures, which can uh, be done through uh, the interruption of cultural logics or dominant uh, cultural logics. So what is critical in this sense is for us to think through what does it mean when we conceptualize community ownership of voice resources. So the question of who owns which also ties into funding. Who funds it? Uh, where does the money come from? Where do the economic resources for voice infrastructures come from? These also then relate to uh, the question of sustainability. So often uh, you might find that we start a academic community collaboration on a voice project. Um, it sustains for three years of the funding cycle or uh, three years that the project is funded. And when we academics leave that setting, uh, the community has lost the resource or the funding uh, to fund that voice infrastructure. And then that gradually dissipates. As a result of which, you often see um, uh, cyclical movements in voice initiatives, but also often fragmentation of voice initi initiatives in a sense that you might see many different voice initiatives in the landscape. But the really critical question in terms of who are these initiatives uh, serving um, is not easily answered, particularly in terms of, say, within a refugee context. Are these really serving refugees? And are these really owned by refugees? refugees or ownership only plays out within uh, particular uh, structures of the dominant framework, which sort of relates to the fourth point, which is the neoliberal co-optation of voice, which is that um, um, there is a seductive appeal to voice in a sense that um, the invitation to voice uh, can be a pretty powerful force in, say, uh, state initiatives of individualizing uh, resources and services, or when state is rolling back uh, specific services that, for instance, are publicly uh, mandated for serving refugees, that can be often done in the name of voice that uh, we have now enabled refugee voice, so we are going to roll down these services and privatize them. So uh, one thing that is uh, often 
um, emergent in our work is looking through how voice becomes co-opted within uh, structures of the market, within public-private partnerships, as well as within states agendas of top-down control. So state reports might have uh, sections on voice um, or sections on voice related to consultation without really that meaning much or without that transformed into community ownership of voice. Which sort of then brings to the last point. So within this context, the CCA articulates that for us to really think about voice as transformative, we ought to consider the ways in which voice becomes an anchor for radical democracy, which is really uh, people's ownership and particularly ownership of subaltern communities of uh, communicative resources, but also the economic decision-making structures, which means that you fundamentally uh, disrupt the everyday structures of decision-making within democracies so that they actually can become more democratized through uh, a subaltern's ownership of those democratic spaces. So in that sense, if you translate it into the refugee context, it would mean uh, really engaging with the question, what are the sites of uh, refugee participation in democratic decision making with regard to refugee related policies? How much does refugee voice matters, especially when as a refugee you don't count as a citizen in a way that you can participate in the democratic process? And what does that then mean in terms of the capacity of refugees to transform uh, the structures that constitute uh, the broader landscape of um, uh, uh, refugees and displacement and uh, expulsion from spaces. So with this, Murdoch, I will open up the floor to you and you walk us through specific examples within this context. So thanks um, everyone for coming along. There's sort of a, like a historical and then a sort of present moment which um, has led to this actually being quite an urgent and a timely issue. But first I want to sort of step back a little bit and because this isn't so much on the double the refugee quota campaign um, this is more on looking as Mahana said on refugee voices in the current context particularly to do with service provision but also to do with the communities uh, themselves in a very particular political moment um, but we also had the question of voice in the double the quota campaign um, I am not really from a refugee background you know, if you want to push my history back a little bit, you could find examples of displacement, um, general ones of people driven off the land in the Scottish Highlands, um, but also of colonization by those same people in coming to this country. Um, so I'm not really speaking from, I'm, I'm, I have never claimed to be speaking from a refugee point of view. And this makes it difficult sometimes when from that point I had been advocating for a very specific change to refugee policy in New Zealand. With that in mind, there is a difference that will sort of, at least is worth bringing up at the start of this, and that's the difference between the people who are stateless at the moment or who are in refugee situations where they don't have the protection of any state. Uh, so these are people not in New Zealand, people, for example, Syrians in Turkey or Lebanon, um, compared to the resettled communities that we have here. So when a refugee arrives in New Zealand through the UN quota, they are given permanent residence on day one, which gives them the rights and the protections of all other New Zealand permanent residents and citizens. And so there's sort of a, a strange question of what the refugee, like which community is being advocated for in the Double the Quota campaign. It's really advocating for those people who aren't here. It's not advocating for the resettled people who are already here. So I tried to make quite a stark divide there and say I'm not speaking for what should happen for our resettled communities. I'm speaking about all the people we should be taking who we haven't been taking if we accept the premises of the campaign. Um, and then I go into those premises, etc. Um, so that said, the, refugee, the resettled refugee communities are probably some of the best advocates for these other people, for these people who haven't got protection because they have gone through the same thing. Yes, they've got different material and political circumstances at the moment, um, and some of them are not interested in participating in this. They've got their own struggles in their communities um, or in their individual lives that don't allow them to put time or energy towards this. But in the broader campaign, and it's it slowly built up through time, again, because I started the campaign 
without much of an idea of what was going on. Uh, pretty much at every public meeting we had, we would have someone from the resettled uh, refugee community speaking, if we could find someone, uh, which wasn't always the case. I spoke in uh, Rotorua. I mean, we, ha we had people from all sorts of different communities. We had some people who had worked with refugees. We had had uh, some iwi leaders in different areas. We had, oh, what else did we have? Some people working with the Red Cross speaking. Um, so this sort of refugee voice at times was very loud in the campaign. Um, we also worked with some of the organizations I'll talk about in this to make sure that those people were able to and it's actually really powerful. It's not even like a, us doing them a favor. It's like if I had to speak after like my friend Ibrahim in Wellington, you've got no chance. This guy's talking about fleeing Eritrea because of forced military conscription, right? And he's, this is, would have been his whole life from 18 through to his mid-50s because it's a permanent forced military conscription. So he's standing there in this church telling everyone about <coughs> um, what he's gone through in life in Sudan and then coming to New Zealand. And then I have to follow this. Like, this guy's voice is so powerful, it's not a favor at all to us. It's, it's something that is, yeah, has, that, has that reach in and of itself. So I wanted to sort of start off by doing that work of just sort of saying the campaign had struggles in this, in the same way that other organizations, advocacy groups do struggle with this. And it is an impure space. It's a place of partiality, um, success and failure, um, and constantly trying to just reinterrogate yourself as to whether you're doing it well or not. Okay, so moving into the refugee voice organizations in New Zealand, it's, refugees were only really established as a category in 1951 in a sort of international law setting. Before that, we had Jewish refugees who came uh, before 1939, and they weren't really refugees, they were immigrants, they were considered an Im <laughs> immigrant category. So it's, it's not something I'm gonna particularly get into in this. There were voices working with those people and Jewish communities helping those people to escape Germany and Austria. Um, and then we had this sort of ad hoc period between 51 and 1987, where it was church and community groups that would sponsor uh, particular refugees to come in and join their communities. And they did all this voluntary community-based work within their organizations. Interestingly enough, there's a community sponsorship model um, taking place at the moment, which there's been a bit of publicity about uh, through Amnesty and some of the churches, which is kind of going back and replicating that same model because they see the community as being something that is missing from the broader, sort of more institutionalized, bureaucratized process. Um, so it was only really in 1987 when the refugee quota was formalized at 800 places that there was a sense that there would always be new people coming to this country and maybe there was a need to professionalize the services um, that helped them settle in. So in those first three years, uh, first, first sort of 10 years, there was this tripartite partnership to try and discuss what the, how to deal with the refugee question, basically. And those were NGOs um, that were working in the area, uh, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, and government agencies. And around 1996, the Auckland Council for Refugees um, was formed, and that was a refugee-led organization um, not particularly well funded, but it was the first attempt to try and have refugee voices heard in the decision making um, around how people were resettled in the country. And then a year later, the um, New Zealand Refugee Council was formed, um, which is again quite a small, not very well funded organization. And mostly, most of these start from one person's sort of passion project where they see there's a need for this and they work to build up these organizations. What really started the um, creation of these refugee voice organizations in New Zealand was the third term of the Labour government under Helen Clark. They initiated a program called Strengthening Refugee Voices. So if we're talking about voices and we're talking about strengthening them for refugees, this sounds like the kind of policy we would like to see. Um, David Cunliffe, a year later, um, gave the number figure on that was $250,000 a year for these organizations to start up to do advocacy, research, and to liaise with government. So these were in four different centers um, that were the main resettlement places at the time, Auckland, Wellington, uh, Hamilton, and Christchurch, all had these refugee voice organizations basically created out of state funding, um, which was an ambitious project. They did hire researchers, 
to actually um, look at the condition, so not just um, talking to people, but actually going a lot deeper in depth interviews. And this was sort of a golden period, at least for, yeah, this was a golden period, really, in the beginning of these organizations in each different community. Um, what had existed with Auckland Refugee Council eventually turned into a specific asylum seeker support trust. So those are the people who come to New Zealand and they haven't got refugee status already, but they've been able to get here and then claim asylum once they're here. And it takes a little while for that to be processed. So they're a little more vulnerable. They don't have the permanent residency yet. And about two thirds are eventually deported of those numbers. So the Auckland Refugee Council sort of focused in on these people, most of whom are in Auckland. Um, and then, uh, obviously, Helen Clark's government lost the election in 2008, and the National Party came in. And the National Party, there were sort of two aspects in the research that showed whether resettlement worked well or not. And one was the ability to be reconnected with family, and the other one was to have good employment outcomes. Um, whether that's to have a job, but also to have a job that matches the skills that you've brought to the country. Um, so in terms of family reunification, their, their trick on this was pretty smart, really. In terms of the quota, they made 95% of all people come as part of a family unit. So much fewer people would come in on their own. This also had the benefit of reducing the need for housing stock, because instead of having a lot of people needing one-room places, um, we had a lot of three and four uh, bedroom places taken by refugees, and there were a lot of, it was actually, at that time, um, in the state housing books, there were a lot more of those available compared to the one and two bedroom places, which are in greater demand presently and, and back then. So that sort of took care of some of the issues around family, really trying to make sure people already had family here, at least in that sort of Western nuclear family sense. And then the second one was this refocus on employment. So there were a whole lot of changes in the way services were deployed to, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a classic neoliberal line. If we can empower people through employment, then they can look after themselves. Um, one of the other things that happened was a slow uh, erosion of the funding for strengthening refugee voices. So we had these four organizations created. In 2011 or, or no, 2012, Manawatu Refugee Voices was created. Um, I don't think it, it may have got some of the Strengthening Refugee Voices funds at the start, but over the coming years, those funds deteriorated to the point now where the funding for that specific project is 50000 a year, at least for the organization I was talking to. Um, it's not always the easiest to, there's actually only one of these organizations has an annual report online. Um, and only two really, yeah. They've, they've really sort of cut back because of the, you know, what's that, a four-fifths cut in the funding for these organizations? But what has also happened in the present is they've broadened the horizons for where they're getting funding from. So this works particularly well for Auckland and Wellington, where there's a larger community and you can do more fundraising. Uh, you have more access to some of those community funding bodies, like the Tyndall Foundation, for example. And so these organizations have started pitching other projects, not about community, uh, about refugee voices, but about other skills, so driver training or to help people, again, get into employment which was one of the focuses of the last government. I think there's also MB funding for driver training as well, because that's tied into the ability to get a job. So that's sort of the, you know, I was going to gesture to Anne Beaglehall's history of refugees in New Zealand and say, if you want an in-depth uh, discussion of the history of refugees in New Zealand, and including these organizations, including asylum seekers, that is the place to go to. But I think I kind of went a little in-depth there. Um, it's also worth, while knowing that a lot of this information comes from two sources. One from academics who are studying the area. There was a great um, is it Kotui Tahi, um, Journal of Online Social Sciences, um, did a special issue in 2014. And there's a couple of exemplary scholars out there who uh, contributed to that, but have been producing work both in the academy <laughs> and funded work, um, particularly in that around 2008 when you know, there was $250,000 for these organizations. And then on the side of it, there's reports from what was the Department of Labor and is now MB. And they have better access to a lot of the data um, than any of the academics, unless the academics can get on side, or that I have access to. So they have all sorts of um, analytics about where refugees have come from, how many have left the country, um, 
This doesn't necessarily pertain to voices, but it does pertain to the size of communities and, and various other aspects. So they're kind of, they do some really good in-depth work as well, and they also use this notion of voice. Um, it's really fascinating to read through. And there's a really sort of telling moment in the latest document about the, oh gee, um, actually I'll rewind a little bit. Um, so the four refugee voice organizations, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, Hamilton, um, also out of that formed a national refugee network, which was those local ones were supposed to be talking about community issues, and they were supposed to be liaising with local government and dealing with them there, but the National Refugee Network, made up of two or three representatives from each one, were supposed to get together and advocate at a national level. So every year there's a uh, National Refugee Resettlement Forum, um, which brings together those old three, which we talked about at the start, NGOs, government, UNHCR, and now it has a fourth participant, which is the National Refugee Network, combined group of these four which has sort of became five when you added the Manawatu Refugee Voices, and then in Nelson, which is another large centre, there's a Multicultural Council of Nelson, which performs some of this work, but I'm not entirely sure if they get any of the Strengthening Refugee Voice Fund, which we've seen in the past. So, for example, an organisation, one of the stronger ones of these is Changemakers Refugee Forum, based in Wellington. Um, this is a list of the group members that they have, associate members, and then some other communities that exist but don't have formalized structures. So a lot of these different groups you can find, there'll be a Facebook page, a website for them, there'll be details about what they do in specifically representing those cultures that they've come from. Um, yeah, one of the curious things I was thinking about when Mohan was speaking about voice was a l almost all of these people um, came from societies where they, their voices were so excluded, they were so um, attacked and rejected from that society that they no longer had any trust in any of the state institutions. Um, particularly the police uh, is the biggest one that people have trouble with when they come here, just learning that the police won't arrest you or seek a bribe off you when you come to the country. So there's a sort of distance, this resettlement process that people have gone through where the sort of the idea that you can have a voice it takes kind of a long time to return to you. Not for, not for everyone, but for a lot of the people. And there's a, a, not necessarily a willingness to partake in, in these organizations like Changemakers. But those organizations, at least together, have formed a lot of um, community and corporation societies. Some of them are nationality-based, like the Wellington Somali Council. Uh, but then you've got, like for example, the Ethiopian community, but also the Greater Wellington Oromo community. So the Oromo are a people in the sort of centre and south of Ethiopia, who uh, <laughs> um, I was over there earlier this year when they were protesting really strongly against the rule of the Tigrayans, who kind of dominate the um, the parliamentary politics in the north. And so they have a sort of a separate community group there. So we have not just nationalities, but also um, like ethnic groups um, that are part of those countries but might reject it. And even though we have things like the Afghan Association of Wellington, that's predominantly Hazara Afghans who are Shia and not Sunni, like the majority of people of Afghanistan, uh, but they still identify with the, the word Afghan, um, at least in New Zealand. Um, then we have a group like Zomi Nkum, which is a really interesting one. That's the Chin people from Burma. And part of their reformulation as a community organization here is to reject the word Chin as a colonial name for them. And so they've taken on the term Zomi and Kuam. Um, then some associate members who weren't there at the start who have got communities that are coming together but they're not incorporated, so Colombian. A lot of the more recent people, Colombian, Sudanese, Tamil, Ugandan. And then other communities, uh, some of whom are more recent uh, and some of whom don't come through the quota like the Iranian population. Um, but many of whom seek asylum. So the asylum populations, mostly Chinese, Iranian, and Iraqi. Um, there's some interesting changes, eh, year to year. This is where my statistics geek stuff happens. For some reason, South Africans zoomed up in it at one point, and then we stopped giving them visas on arrival, and that kind of cut the numbers. All sorts of rumors about why this happened. People, Zimbabweans with fake South African passports, all sorts of, I mean, <laughs> 
it's a bit embarrassing, right? We're talking about people's lives, but there is a sort of a statistical nerdiness and fascination with the lives that are behind all these, you know, numbers and, and names. Um, so, yeah, those, that's kind of where it's at at the moment. We're at a really interesting point where there's this challenge with the strengthening refugee voices funding having been diminished, and yet in the national resettlement strategy, a voice is right up there. They talk that we, this has been created in conjunction with refugee communities and in consultation with them. So even though a huge amount of the funding has been pulled, these organizations are smaller than they were five years ago, there's still a sense that, these, that there is a need for voice or a reliance on voice, or at least in, you know, in that consultative way where they have to check something off that they says we've talked through with these people. So there's a point in time now where it's a real question about what the Strengthening Refugee Voices project will look like, particularly with a new Labour government. Um, which leads into this kind of question around parliamentary politics and parliamentary futures. In a lot of academic work, in a lot of government work, in a lot of NGO work, you can't use the words Labour, Greens and National um, because of the drive towards political neutrality. In almost all of the events I go to around refugee resettlement, no one uh, talks about the political makeup of government. No one talks about the aims and desires of the different parties. It's all this very curious neutral space, as if government is this sort of singular monolithic thing that doesn't change or, um, and, and can't, certainly can't be lobbied against. Um, and some of, some of this is because you can't be seen to be preferring a particular party over another. At the present stage, the Labour government is more, I would say, more pro-refugee, um, certainly than the National Party. Uh, the Green Party, I think, has also claimed that they want to be the most pro-migrant party in Parliament. Um, <laughs> I guess since I'm unemployed at the moment, I can, I can talk about politics like this without too much of a worry about my job. Um, but it, it's also like, it, you also really have to consider this stuff if you want to think about strengthening refugees, refugee voices as a project of the third term of a Labour government that was interested in trying to strengthen community voices, at least in the way it was you know, establishing organizations like this. And then them losing power and then nationals focus on employment and reducing the amount of funding for these voice these organizations. And then we can think about, okay, well, if there is some sort of pragmatic side to the Labour Party and their promise at the last election was we will double the refugee quota, uh, their potentials, assuming they get at least one more term, this is kind of the trajectory in New Zealand with politics, two or three terms. Um, are there possibilities to lobby them on reconsidering the Strengthening Refugee Voices project? Um, so this is a, something I am working on with some of the refugee voice organizations. Um, I've talked to three of the five so far and have a meeting lined up in a few, in about a week with these organizations um, to think about that very specific political opportunity. Um, there's a whole lot that can be speculated, right? Is New Zealand First going to be there? Are they not? What are the Greens doing? What's the role of someone like Golri Skaraman, the first refugee background person appointed, well, elected to government for the Green Party? Does that mean they'll be wanting to lead on this? Does this mean Labour will want to counter that? There's a whole lot of things that we can talk about. We can talk about whether Ian Lees Galloway will be the immigration minister there, who else we can create relationships with, uh, what we can do with the National Party at the moment, um, who will be their spokesperson for immigration if Woodhouse finally gets health. So there's a whole lot of sort of challenges um, <coughs> to the potential and, and at the same time opportunities in this moment. I wanted to focus on this with Mohan because I think it's an opportunity right now. Um, I feel like Labour and the left have felt like they've done their bit, at least in this term, and they may well be looking for a project uh, at the next election. And this fits in pretty well because they can point towards National having cut it, therefore National not caring about this community voice. That might make National vulnerable. They might want to make a, a similar offer in their um, election. Uh, I don't know what they call them. It's got to say portfolio. What are they? Election promises. Uh, and then finally, there's one more sort of challenge, which is another opportunity, um, which before I actually learned the sort of more in-depth stuff about this, was 
that now we're in a situation over the next two years, well in the last two years we've had two new resettlement places opened in Dunedin and Invercargill. Dunedin's taking the second greatest number of refugees at the moment, more than Auckland, um, more than, yeah, it's Wellington, Dunedin at the moment. And yet there hasn't been any move to help establish any voice in these spaces. Um, there have been little projects happening, but as Mohan was saying before, these are very um, sort of specific and funding dependent and not exactly focused on strengthening or creating refugee voices. So we're in a situation where two have been created in the past and the next two years, five or six new resettlement locations will emerge around the country. And these are places um, that haven't been announced yet but which there's a, you know, there's, you know, it really is a challenge or, a, or an opportunity um, to see how those people fit in. It's a threat to the government because no one wants to see a story like happened a few years ago of racial intimidation of refugees in the Hawke's Bay, um, which stopped them resettling there, as well as some of the housing issues. Um, so there is sort of political sensitivity about how these new resettlement places work. There's also the opportunity though to strengthen some of the organizations that already exist in mentorship roles um, to start up some similar organizations. What will probably most likely happen is that there will be single ethnic communities in each of these places. Invercargill's got Colombian people, uh, Dunedin started with Syrian and Palestinian and is moving to Burmese in the next year. So what will probably happen is we won't have these big lists like this for maybe five, six, perhaps ten years. It might take that long until uh, there are maybe five, six, seven community organizations that um, need the sort of assistance to come together if they want to. Um, so there are these sort of, yeah, forward thinking opportunities, um, not just with those resettlement locations, but if strengthening refugee voices funding um, comes back a little bit, then you know, maybe there can be a, a stronger attempt at having a public face to something like the National Refugee Network, which is supposed to be overarching, or the New Zealand Refugee Council, which still exists, but doesn't have the resources and the capacity to really speak um, in the way that some of these well-funded organizations um, can. So then there's sort of one last point on these opportunities, and that is one of those beautiful political things that we all need, which is negotiating power. So if we look at the Australian situation, I talked about this in the Tuesday talk, um, all of those organizations have become independent of government funding and they criticize the government in a much harsher way than any of ours do. Um, because the SRV funding has been cut, those organizations have sought other funding strategies and some have found them. Um, some, it's, it's four-fifths of their budget now, or even five-sixths come from alternative funding strategies. Um, and yet they're still beholden to some of the requirements if you're working with government to represent them, uh, to be impartial, to be neutral. So there's a possibility that these organizations could say we will no longer accept government funding. Um, it's too little to be of use to us. We would prefer to be independent and we would prefer to politicize the space ourselves, raise funds that way and see if what New Zealanders would, would do to fund these organizations. So at the very least, that's a good negotiating point. Um, to be able to tell the government, you know, if you're going to give us this money, um, you're not just buying us off. Um, you're going to have to pay a lot more if that's what you think you're doing. So this is, I mean, this is stuff that probably shouldn't be on a camera and shouldn't be, you know, this is more of the strategizing in back rooms about how you negotiate to get what you want. But this is the political opportunity that's occurring right now and that I hope these organizations will, um, will see the value of their voice and not have it that it can just be sort of assumed or written into documents. So I think that's the end of the sort of where we've been, where we're going, and the sort of opportunity side of this. We haven't, I haven't really got into it, and this is a great work with Mohan, thinking about voice, thinking about, you know, reading all these documents, eh? And they're, they're just words on paper. There's something embodied about voice, something powerful, like my friend Ibrahim speaking in this church about what he's gone through. Something that isn't, you know, isn't words on paper. And you lose that tone and you lose that, um, yeah, you lose some of that passion and some of that resistance and, I don't know, the, uh, yeah, you just lose something when it's written down. So there's something I think we still 
we'll talk about in that transformative aspect of voice when it's connected to a body, when it's connected to a presence like we're here now, rather than in these One kind of... interesting is sort of the question of sustainability because you really draw out that it seems like there was funding at one point which sort of drove these amazing sets of organizations. Yeah. The question is what is really to be done, whether through a political process or some kind of transformation that sort of writes in the funding as a sustainable commitment, uh, as a way to actually support these voices. Mm. Yeah, which is, which is one of the real challenges is trying to make it so you can't like with the refugee quota, for example, I was trying to work in there that it would be um, increased with population growth every three years that it's reconsidered so that we don't have to campaign on it again so it doesn't go unchanged for 30 years. So there are like techniques, I guess, to, to divorce it from the political cycles. Yeah.